Julian, in the debate between materialism, that the mind is only the product of the brain, and some kind of non-physicalism, whether it's dualism of the soul or some other variety, a number of arguments come into the, uh, the fray. Uh, one is the, um, uh, the argument that the brain and the mind are so different that they cannot possibly be the same thing. One, you have electrical impulses, different uh, chemicals going across membranes, and the other, you have a concept of aboutness, something about this room. H how can one produce the other? Well, I mean, it's a strange question in a way, because yes, in one sense, it's very, very difficult to understand that. I don't think anyone probably does understand that. But what we do understand is that things seem very different from different perspectives, from different levels. It's very different if you're on the inside looking out or the outside looking in, for example. A car looks very different if you're looking at it through a microscope than if you're looking at it with the human eye, than if you're looking at it from a satellite. Mm -hmm. okay? So the fact that things can appear to be so very different, depending on which perspective you have, shouldn't be surprising. And I think what we have here is there's very, very different perspectives involved when you're a person from the inside having feelings, sensations, and so forth, and you're looking at it from the outside. Actually, it makes a difference whether you're looking at it from the outside as another human being, or looking at it from the outside as a kind of a, you know, biological entity, mm -hmm. as, as a scientific construct. Mm -hmm. So I just think there are different ways of looking at these things. It's not surprising they appear to be radically different. <laughs> Okay, let's take another argument, uh, the so-called philosopher zombie argument, which says that you can have another Julian sitting right here, exactly the same, just as good looking, just as articulate, just as thoughtful, but that Julian has nothing inside, doesn't feel anything. It's an extraordinarily powerful robot in essence, uh, but with indistinguishable in terms of behavior. The argument by some is that that indicates that the idea of inner consciousness is a further fact which you can never know and therefore is something different than a materialism. I sometimes think I'm a bit sort of tone deaf on the zombie argument. I must admit, I don't quite get it. What's it supposed to show? If there's meant to be a logical possibility that you could have two physically identical things, one of them has an inner state of consciousness, the other doesn't, well, fine, but logical possibility doesn't tell us what's possible in the material world, I don't think. Well, There's you... a different kind of, of possibility. It may just be a fact about the universe that if you have a physical being like yourself with all your neurons and so forth, you are going to have consciousness that is going to emerge just inevitably. I suspect that's true. So I think that zombies remain purely logical possibilities. I don't think they're physical possibilities, material possibilities. Legitimate argument. So, so the conclusion of that argument, to which I think you are, must be committed to, is that uh, you can build non-biological intelligences which not only will behave intelligently, but will be so inside. So you would have in silicon or a supercomputer of the future, however many connections it will take, or however the parallel structure will be, that ultimately, in, in principle, that will be built and it will have internal consciousness. Well, no, actually, I'm not committed to that. Because Tell we me don't, why. We don't know, because what I've said is that I'm committed to the view that if we were to make something just like you, in other words, out of organic matter yes. of the same kind, it would have consciousness. Now, it's often assumed that the critical factor is a matter of connections, if you like, a purely structural mm -hmm. element. Mm -hmm. But as it's called some, fun functional, right. functional. But as someone like John Searle, the philosopher, has pointed out, that may not be the case. It may be that for some reason we don't yet understand that only certain types of physical matter will inevitably lead to the arising of consciousness. So it may be that we require organic brains and you can never generate consciousness in silicon. So again, this is one of those open questions. You know, we don't yet know. But all I'd be committed to saying was if we were to be able to create synthetically the exactly same kind of brain, a human-like brain with the same kind of organic matter, then yes, that would be conscious. Okay, well, what about the argument that says uh, if we take a human brain, split it in half, this sounds r really yeah. radical, but there are some experiments that, ha not experiments, for people with ep epilepsy, you can split brains. Sure. 
And so in some future science, a thousand years from now, and somebody has an accident, you could actually take that brain, put it in two parts, the left and right, and put it in two uh, donor bodies, maybe who recently died. So what happens then to my consciousness? My consciousness goes into two separate left brain, right brain, or two separate bodies. There seem to be four possibilities. One, each, each of those new people will claim to be me. Mm. That's when they wake up. That's for sure. So the four possibilities. One is that I don't exist, there are two new people. Uh, second is that there are two of me, which sounds illogical. Uh, a third is that the left one is me and the right one's an imposter, and the fourth is that the right one and the left one yeah. an imposter. It, it seems like those are the only four possibilities, in which case consciousness is a further fact about the physical world. Well, there's a lot going on in that summary of the <laughs> argument. I'm not sure where to begin. I mean, first of all, we've got to acknowledge this is actually a hypothetical. No one thinks you could actually divide the brain into, and you would have literally identical yeah. memories. I mean, this is a this is building on something which can actually occur, and imagining it's it's simpler than that. If you could do that, if you could divide your brain, and each division would have a, the same memories. Well, the question you ask is an interesting one. I think a lot of the problem, though, is that why should we assume there has to be a factual answer to that question? It's assuming that the logic of identity is going to apply in this case. Now, as a matter of fact, it, it may be the case that when you divide in that way, in a strict sense, neither of them is you. But if both of them, so that's the answer to that, neither of them is you. But that leaves something remaining, which is that still, they're both continuous of you. They both have something of what matters about yeah. you. Yeah. And for me, this is a really critical thing. In the philosophy of personal identity, a lot of people get fixated on the question of, you know, how can we say this person is the same as that person mm -hmm. in the future, given a change? Whereas really, I think the question is, what is important about our continued existence? And how much of what is important about our con continued existence is you know, remains in that really weird scenario. That doesn't give you a neat factual answer about which one is me, your four possibilities. It gives well, you a much open, more open answer about, well, again, you have to start itemizing it. These aspects of survival are guaranteed here. These things are lost. Uniqueness is normally something we want for our future. We don't want there to be two of me tomorrow. That means I've got all sorts of problems. For example, who's, you know, what about my wife? You know, what I, so, you know, uniqueness is lost, but other things are preserved. The intentions, the projects, the beliefs. Yeah, but again, I have this inner awareness, um, and and it sounds like you're saying that that would not exist, but there would be two other versions of this. So I would have gone to sleep and not wake up. Well, you know, it, 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 literally speaking, it may be the case that what's happened is that, you know, you could say the one person has ceased to exist and another two have continued to exist. Yeah. But as continuers... I mean, that may be the best description, but I don't really see what's deeply problematic about that. You may think that's a weird way of looking at things, but it's a coherent way of looking at things. And so, kind of integrating all these arguments together, uh, what's your view of how you identify the, what we call the mind with the output of the brain? Well, it seems to be very, very clear. I mean, this seems to be one of those things which is... You know, the evidence is so strong, it cannot be denied. Whatever consciousness is, whatever sense of self is, it emerges because there is a functioning brain inside a functioning body. And you don't need anything more than that to explain how it is generated. Once you start getting down to the question of, well, exactly how does that happen? There are mysteries, there are things we don't understand. But that it happens, I think, is, is indisputable. And I think people who take the remaining mysteries as somehow evidence for the fact that perhaps there's more going on than simply brain and body operating in their normal natural way. I think they're clutching at straws. For some reason they want to believe that there must be something else in this world. They don't want us to be just brains and bodies. For me there's no just about it. You know, People use this just as a way of trying to put down the <laughs> argument. We're not just brains and bodies. We are brains and bodies and we are remarkable brains and bodies who have this capacity for thought, reflection, love, feeling, desire, knowledge, wisdom, and all these things.